Hello, you're watching Daily Debrief. It's been 150 days since Israel's genocidal war on Gaza began. 150 days of utter impunity and contemptuous dismissal of calls from across the world to halt this atrocity. The death toll has crossed 30,500 and close to 72,000 people have been injured. Thousands are missing. Meanwhile, the US and its allies continue their steadfast support of Israel, blocking calls for a ceasefire, parroting Israel's claims of self-defense, and refusing to acknowledge the thousands of deaths in extremely brutal circumstances. We go to Abdul for the latest on this war. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. So it's been 150 days since the war began and, uh, you know, the brutality is continuing. Of course, uh, a couple of days ago, we saw a horrible massacre of people who were waiting for food aid. Some uh, even humanitarian assistance has become uh, has become part of the death toll, so to speak. So could you maybe now take us to what is the situation with the war, especially the Israeli offensive at this point? Well, Prashant, in the last 24 hours, more than 100 Palestinians have been killed. And as you rightly pointed out, there was yet another attack on the uh, Palestinians who were seeking aid uh, in the Gaza city. So the, the killing in the last week of more than 100 people, Palestinians uh, again in Gaza uh, city uh, is basically repeated despite uh, uh, the global condemnation, despite the uh, uh, kind of attempt by the Israelis to say that what happened on in the last week was basically the fault of the Palestinians themselves, who basically uh, kind of uh, in a desperate uh, way stampede uh, and created a situation, chaotic situation, which led to the killing of people. But uh, the repeat and again, there are uh, reports coming that uh, most of the people who were killed were killed by the Israeli gunfire. And even uh, so even tanks were involved. So that is what ha is happening. Apart from that, uh, there are also uh, reports coming that a large number of Palestinian children are now uh, are subjected to malnutrition and death because of the uh, lack of food. The, the number of Palestinians, as per the latest report, has reached 16. Uh, Palestinian children, I'm saying, who have died because of the uh, confirmed uh, 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 cases of malnutrition, lack of food, and so on and so forth. So the humanitarian aid, which was uh, now there was a, a spectacle made last week of U.S. Uh, 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 kind of uh, air dropping aid, Jordanians air dropping aid. In fact, this air dropping is basically looks like a, a kind of attempt to hide the global failure of pressurizing Israel to kind of uh, allow more and more uh, uh, humanitarian aid on the ground so that the Palestinians, millions of them who are not able to get enough food, uh, get it. And that basically affecting their uh, health and particularly the health of the children. So that is uh, what is happening in the Gaza Strip, both in fact, there were there are reports that, despite uh, the warnings, again uh, uh, in terms of Rafa, uh, Israeli forces were involved in bombing uh, Rafa in the last 24 hours, and, and around, uh, dozens of people have been reportedly killed in those air strikes which were carried out in Rafa in the last 24 hours. So yeah, so if you see, there is uh, all the set patterns which are there since October 7, uh, Israelis uh, dropping bombs on the Palestinians, Israeli not Israelis not allowing uh, humanitarian aid to reach to the affected people, and uh, kind of particularly targeting uh, Palestinian children continues. And, and it, the situation is, uh, as, as, as I said before, is same as we discussed uh, uh, previously. Well, Abdul, in this, in this context also, could you tell me a bit about what has been the discussion around the truce? The discussions have been going on for quite some time now. Uh, every couple of days, you know, media reports seem to indicate there's some uh, proximity to a settlement, but nothing has been finalized yet. Well, uh, uh, as far as the uh, dialogues are concerned, there are there are clear reports that the, though the there are parties discussing uh, the truce in uh, uh, Cairo, uh, uh, particularly what uh, uh, U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris said uh, on Sunday about uh, uh, the kind of need of a kind of ceasefire, which later she clarified that she is not talking about a permanent ceasefire, only for six weeks during the Ramadan and extra days uh, a ceasefire. There, there is a progress on that. But 
uh, as far as Israelis are not participating in it. Uh, the, uh, the Israeli media is reporting that the Israeli delegation has not been sent and it will not be sent as per uh, the latest reports. Uh, so whatever uh, discussions are there, whatever terms are there in the public, it seems that Israelis uh, do not agree with them, uh, with those uh, uh, terms. And despite the US claims, despite the claims made by Egyptians and other uh, parties involved, it seems the Israelis are not ready to uh, uh, talk at this moment. Uh, and that is the latest situation. Uh, if you see uh, uh, in terms of aggression, uh, uh, not only in Gaza, but in other parts of Palestine also, uh, the Israelis have not uh, taken any steps to kind of uh, bring any uh, confidence that uh, uh, that they are willing to uh, kind of uh, halt their aggression and uh, willing to have some kind of even temporary ceasefire at this moment. Fair Abdul, thank you so much for that update. A study by University of Oxford researchers has revealed that privatization of hospitals leads to worsening healthcare outcomes for patients. The study conducted across various high-income countries found that in some cases, higher levels of privatization were even linked to higher rates of avoidable deaths. We go to Anna to find out more about this study. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. A uh, study which uh, I guess its outcomes are not really surprising for those who follow this show, for those who have been working in the field of health activism like you. But first of all, could you maybe take us to what are the key findings of this study? Well, as you said, it's not really surprising. It's something that uh, as activists, as uh, people who have been following health from uh, a health for all perspective, uh, we have been saying all along. Uh, and that is that, unsurprisingly, privatization of health does not work. It does not work as uh, a regular good on the market. It cannot be left to market forces in order for it to function and to fulfill the role of um, of supporting people's right to health, of uh, pro of giving them the chance to to lead a better life. So what this recent study did is uh, was looking at uh, some of the previously done analysis uh, of health systems in high income countries and specifically at cases where uh, previously public health services, including primary health, but also including hospitals, have been privatized and how that has impacted outcomes uh, and quality of care primarily. And so what it shows is that, of course, you know, uh, once uh, something is privatized, that overwhelmingly you see uh, a reduction in the number of staff, you see a reduction in accessibility for people. Uh, and so uh, essentially what you see is a fall of the quality of care for, for patients. Uh, and that's interesting because it's something that's usually used as an argument in favor of privatization when uh, those who want to privatize health systems approach governments when they uh, when they approach the people the first thing that they say uh, is your health system is going to be more functional it's going to work easily it's going to be more accessible to you if we privatize because the public sector is so cumbersome uh, it's so slow it doesn't actually work so if we privatize it's going to look uh, it's going to look better uh, now, what this research shows is that it's essentially the opposite. So uh, while public uh, public systems do struggle because they are underfunded, because uh, they're very big systems, which are very difficult to organize and to make sure that, you know, that uh, they can function on an everyday basis, uh, because the private sector puts uh, a highlight on profits instead of health, uh, it Turns out that you know they they cut on some of the very elementary issues, uh, including uh, including pace, including the, the number of nurses or do, of nurses and of uh, non-medical uh, health staff which are working with patients, uh, and more often than that, even they tend to cut the number of cleaning staff, of technical staff, and this of course has also impacts on on quality of care, but it's not something that they're really prone to uh, to say openly. So essentially, when you cut the, the the number of cleaners at the hospital, you are putting people at a very great risk of uh, of contracting hospital infections. That's something that this research also uh, also points out. Right, and in this context, of course, uh, the another key aspect is that even in the, within this study, privatization probably there are some winners and some losers when it comes to privatization. It's a very clear class angle as well. So you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, uh, and this is, again, something that we have seen over time uh, is that um, when 
advo when advocates of private healthcare come and uh, and point out the so-called good examples of how private care has improved uh, accessibility and uh, communications am uh, among uh, the health system and patients, uh, what they often overlook is that the private health system caters to a very specific crowd. So it's rich people, it's people who can afford private healthcare who go to private healthcare. Now, of course, because of the whole uh, of the whole background of social determinants of health, uh, we know that rich people or even middle class people uh, are of better health than of poor communities. So, of course, if you tend to attract people who can pay for healthcare, uh, to begin with, you are set to uh, to attract people, patients who are in better health. So of course it's more it's reasonable is reasonable to assume that the care that you will provide them will be uh, less uh, it will be less expensive, it will take less time, it will be easier to sort out and you can focus on those aspects of care which can generate much much bigger profits for you. On the other hand, if you're a public health system, you care for everyone. So you care uh, and uh, because of this influx and of the strengthening of the private health sector, you tend to get uh, patients who are uh, in extremely vulnerable health positions who did not have the chance to care for their health uh, for their health before. Uh, so they're also more prone to turn up with very complicated health issues, which are uh, which take a long time to to address if they can be addressed at all. So it's kind of you know. Uh, not essentially showing that uh, the successes of the private health system, if there is, uh, comes because it's actually, uh, it's very specific to, to a particular uh, population. Right, and finally, I guess the key question often after studies like this is that, is there really an alternative, especially considering the spree of privatization that has taken place over the past few decades with austerity policies, policies with neoliberalism, so are there any examples of this process going in the reverse? Well, yes, I think it's fair to say that yes, there is. And while this study, um, it, it has to be said, it focused particularly on countries from the global north. Uh, so it's a bit different than if we look at, uh, at the global picture. Um, but if we look at the global picture, uh, we do see people's initiatives to take back healthcare uh, all over the place. So uh, people have been, uh, Essentially, they've been very vocal about uh, the effect that the privatization of healthcare is having on their health status. So um, we've seen from alternative attempts to organize health uh, healthcare uh, come up in Belgium, you know, through medics for the people who are trying to rebuild and to operate within a system which is not really people people oriented to, to begin with. Uh, but then we have seen a range uh, of, uh, of cases, you know, uh, along the tracks of deprivatization and remunicipalization uh, from other parts of what was used, what used to be a public sector, uh, and people taking back hospitals, people taking back health centers, uh, people standing up to the closure of uh, of local health institutions. So uh, that's definitely something that's uh, going to be an interesting thing to follow as privatization uh, pressures continue. Right. Thank you so much, Anna, for that analysis. Thanks. And that's all we have in today's Daily Debrief. We'll be back with a new episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.